Okay, so uh, basic feedback that I saw from the, uh, the quiz as I was walking around. Uh, store words, so there's no need to write back from data memory to the registers. So I know if you had that there, so that that's a, I think that's a half point. Um, some people forgot the ALU source multiplexer. Some people forgot to put 15 to 11 to the register. You have to have that written there to be able to update that. Uh, for number two, the uh, common mistake was some, the correct answer for speed up was N plus K minus one times T of P uh, times a uh, number of instructions, let's see, right? That was your speed up. And the most mistakes were people putting different values for this, N minus K, I saw a few of that, N plus K for getting the minus one. I also saw a lot of times K up here, which will be just not correct because single cycle accounts for all the stages because it all happens in one stage. So uh, number three, uh, it's like snowflakes. Everybody put a feel like everybody put a unique answer. Uh, just review that truth table. You'll see that again on the uh, final exam. Um, yeah. So uh, so I have everyone's homework assignments. So we're starting to hit the home stretch. Um, the, I saw a couple groups have already submitted their uh, their submissions for the project, right? For the, and the other groups have you're working on it, getting close. Uh, so that's due tonight, and I'll be everybody who did one. You also get a TGO score because, as I said, you, you get the bonus for attendance. Uh, now, okay, so. Section eight. Now we're hitting this concept of, which I had left virtual memory out of that. We're uh, focusing. No. 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 Where's all the work I did yesterday to do my correct section eight? There you go. That's more like it. So now we've hit the, uh, the end of the road on single cycle, and now we're going to start trying to improve performance using this concept of multiprocessing, which I'm sure you've all heard of, like quad-core processors and multiprocessors. And for those of you who are gamers, mass massively uh, parallel processing, because you've got to be able to process all of that game data simultaneously, right? So we're going to be learning a lot about how that's done. We're going to be learning about what multiprocessors are. You're going to be talk, we're going to be talking briefly about uh, TLP versus ILP, which is a very important concept and a very common interview question. What's one of the two types of uh, levels of multiprocessing? Those are known as thread and instruction level processing. Multi-cycle uh, multi MEPS data path is an, ex an example of instruction level. So we're getting, we have one data path where we have five instructions running simultaneously. So that's a form of parallelism. So you're already, you're already familiar with multiprocessing. So now it's just a matter of like defining them formally, seeing how they're designed, seeing some of the challenges of actually implementing them. And uh, then we're going to be uh, learning about branch prediction. So when you have, if you have multiprocessor and you're using multiple processors to process a single program, and let's say you get to a point where one of your instructions is doing, the, sorry, one of your threads is doing a branch, but another one is starting to do the calculations inside the branch, and the other processor is eventually going to come around and tell you that information you need in order to decide whether or not the branch is taken. We're going to be learning about branch taken versus branch not taken, and then we're going to be learning about branch prediction. We're going to learn specifically about, there are many, many different types. We're going to learn one in particular in this course called two-bit branch prediction, and then we're going to be learning uh, about something called Tomasulo's algorithm. Now the whole idea of that is how do you actually be able to use 
vault heads of different, you know, we've talked a lot up to this point about risk systems. So now we're going to expand into something called VLIW, very large instruction word, and see how can you use multiple portions of data paths to be able to do what's known as uh, out of order execution. So if you get a number of instructions, you don't necessarily execute them in order, but it's guaranteed to produce the right result in the fastest time. So first we have multiprocessor. Uh, first part just seems pretty simple. A multiprocessor is a computer system with two or more processors. The objective of running a multiprocessor is connecting multiple computers to get higher performance. So our whole idea is we want to be able to kind of break down a process, a program, into a number of different stages, or be able to run multiple programs simultaneously. And like multiprocessing, it allows it a lot easier to run a mouse and run the I.O. to the monitor and the keyboard and you know, this huge setup I have going on here where I have a USB to hold my lecture notes and I have, a, you know, I have to maintain the power consumption, the, the mouse. I have to have all this stuff with Epic Pen here, so I have to be able to run that simultaneously and be able to go through the, all the VGA system and HDMI in order to be able to broadcast it so you can see it, all while being while recording it using debut so that way I can post it on YouTube later. So it's all running that in parallel. So here we have a parallel processing program is a single program that runs on multiple processors simultaneously. Permits a single program to run on I'm getting rid of that part of the definition. That's the, the Department of Redundancy Department approved that. So, a multi-core processor, on the other hand, is a single integrated chip that contains multiple processors. Each of these processors is called a core. So the whole idea is now you have one integrated chip and it's being split up into multiple cores that are running threads simultaneously on. So you can have multiple chips that have a multiplexer deciding between them, or, and now it's really becoming common nowadays to see dual core, quad core processors, eight core, a lot of research being done on like, you know, 1,000 core, 1,024 core processors. And so that's an example of multi-core processing. Now, 8.4, this distinction becomes really important. So basically it's building on the differences between parallel processing and multi-core processors into the concepts of instruction level processing and thread level parallelism. So instruction level processor overlaps the execution of instructions for improved performance. So for example, you have a single cycle data path, you have fetch, decode, execute, memory, and write back. Then so you see how in the data path you're starting to get more and more instructions inside the same data path simultaneously. So you're starting to overlap them. You're using the same processor to do multiple instructions simultaneously. That's instruction level parallelism, which is why I said MIPS pipelining does this. So you've already studied a form of parallelism and you actually executed a parallel processor on the football field. It also relies on software technology. So a lot of software being able to manage this, define parallelism, and statically compile, a statically at compile time. So there's a lot of stuff that's going to be outside the scope of this course, but being able to do concepts of loop unrolling and multi-threading and how it's actually done is done with this overhead with the operating system. It exploits implicit parallel operations within a loop or straight line code segments. So when you do your problems and you're doing your project and you have your loop, right, and it loops a number of times, and what happens is if you have a big enough loop, there are actually ways to optimize it to be able to reduce the number. It'll actually unroll it. So let's say it's five instructions and you have to loop four times. So at compile time, it figures that out and goes, okay, well, normally I would need 20, but through this optimization, I can get it down to 15 or 14 or even 13, for example. So the whole goal is to be able to try to reduce this as much as possible. And then thread level parallelism is logically structured as separate threads of execution. So now we're actually using different processors to complete these uh, um, executions. 
Unlike instruction level parallelism, thread level parallelism is explicitly represented by the use of multiple threads of execution that are inherently parallel. So what's going on here is what I just described with my computer is thread level parallelism. So it's allocating different threads to the I.O. It's allocating different threads to the keyboard. It's allocating different threads to, uh, to the debut, uh, uh, the uh, mouse, uh, the VG, HDMI VGA cables. And it's all doing that in different threads. And the reason why you want to keep them in separate threads is because you want, especially for those of you who are going to be taking operating systems, you're going to be dealing with something called, uh, you're going to be dealing with uh, resource hazards. And if you, one, and you get these instances known as deadlock, where some one instance is waiting for another project to finish, while the other project you know, is waiting. There's a, it's known as circular wait, and it actually breaks. And what's actually happening with, uh, you know, when you're using Eclipse, and you have your project hangs up on a pointer issue, the reason why is it's because the program is trying to run, and it's waiting for, a, it's trying to access a specific memory element, and the other program is saying, hey, wait, you can't do this, so it's cycling out. Normally, uh, it should give you an error message that says, you know, compiler error or segmentation fault, and then you figure out where your pointer error was. So, th things we learn the first time we go through the course. I apologize, you guys, for the guinea pigs, but. So, dealing with, uh, sorry, I'm going to move that down one line. So, these two types of issues, like parallel processing has become uh, a new thing very recently, within the last five to ten years. Up until then, there were two major issues that were withholding it from being a real, in, real implementation. First of all, you have to actually write code that can be implemented on a single cycle processor and a multi cycle. I'm sorry, not a single cycle processor as well as a parallel processor. So if you are writing bad code that isn't going to work in the parallel processor, it becomes very difficult for the compiler to be able to be properly drive the micro engine. So we now know that software must be designed to meet the instruction set architecture, which we've learned now in this course. Writing a program that can be implemented in both sequential and parallel implementation is very difficult. So think about it this way. People are trying to implement finite state machines on parallel processors. And you, sometimes you're going to be waiting for that to come back and you need a specific bit of information before you can go to the next state, and that can become challenging. Parallel software requires significant communications overhead and coordination. Two, cache coherence, which we'll learn about towards the end of the section, becomes a much larger challenge in the case of multiprocessors. So now we're talking about page swapping, and we're talk, you know, and then we're talking about cache blocks moving back and forth between levels of cache. Well, now if you have different levels of cache with different processors, and you have a copy of variables in, in uh, multiple processors, in, in the instance where you're using multiple processors to do the same code, you can have one copy of the value variable that's been ha, has been updated from five to seven, and the other one over here hasn't been updated yet. So you need to know which one you want to use. So you need to be able to update all the copies of the variable throughout multiple processors in cache. So therefore, since multiple programs may be trying to access the same data simultaneously. Oh. Does this make sense so far? All right. So here's a good example. Uh, I think I got space. Yeah, I got a little bit of space. Um, so I can try to make that font bigger. Or I can just zoom in. All right, so here's the idea. Suppose you want to achieve a speed up of 25. So you have a specific program, and you, want, you for whatever reason, you need it to run 25 fa times faster. Because you are wholly impatient. I don't want my program to run now. Right? Now you have 50 processors. You, you go crazy by uh, a computer with 50 processors. What fraction of the original computation should be in parallel? So we were talking before about how there's certain portions of the program that need to be explicitly parallel, and we design it in such a way. Well, now we go back to Amdahl's law. 
So this is another variation of the, remember I told you there's a variation that I didn't really need you to understand at that point. So basically, if you rearrange the equation, remember we had uh, affected divided by speed up plus unaffected equals nu. You put it in a different way, you get this equation here, which is speed up equals the fraction in parallel times the, divided by the speed up enhanced plus 1 minus the fraction in parallel. So you solve it, you get 1 over speed up minus 1, 1 minus speed up e over 1. And so the way this works is your speed up is 25, right? So I need 1 minus 20, 1 over 25 minus 1 over speed up e, which is my affected. So now I'm trying to get 50 processors. So now I'm trying to say if I have a speed up and I have this many processors, what percentage does this need to be? And it came up to, the unit said it'll be 0.9896, which is 98.96%. So the whole goal is to figure out precisely how much you need to be able to explicitly put in parallel. It's kind of a general understanding question. You won't really see this one on the exam, but this next one here uh, will be a really good uh, understanding of uh, pipeline um, parallelism type question. So that's a linear pipe here, right? So the whole idea is that it's a pipeline adder of four stages. So we see one, two, three, four, and we have a feedback delay stage. And so what happens is these X's here can be our multiplexers, and we're trying to choose which value we're going to put back in. So the whole goal here is we're going to try to find the cumulative sum of 20 integers, right? So normally if you, you would take 1, 2, 3, 4, you add 2, you turn the 1 back, you get a third one, fourth one, right? So that can then take a, quite a bit of time. So now we're going to try to use parallel processing to be able to reduce that. The linear pipe has a one cycle delay element, as described, in the feedback path. Show the hardware. So on an exam, I'll ask you to draw this. So if it's four stages, draw one, two, three, four, and it'll have a delay cycle. So just draw the delay. And then you're going to draw the staple. Show the hardware for implementing this in ILP. Calculate the total number of cycles required to compute the cumulative sum. So here's how that works. What's going to happen is you're going to be using these inputs here to be able to put in value. So I've notated it here as A0 through A19 because it's 20 integers. And so the first thing you do, you put the first two integers in, and then you add it, and then it's going to move on to the second stage, right? And then what's going to happen is, so that's what happened, I'm sorry, that's what happens here. So that moves on to the second stage. Then what's going to happen is, the next cycle, so this is cycle one, cycle two, you're going to put in A2 and A3. So now you've put in the first four numbers, right? See how this is working? So here now we have A1 plus A0, second stage, A2 plus A3. And then the next stage, we're going to put in A4 plus A5. And then you have A3 plus A2. You have A1 plus A0. And then here's what's going to happen here. So at the fourth cycle, we're going to have our first sum value. So what's going to happen is we're going to start putting it back through here. So then we're going to start getting delays. So what's going to happen is we want to accumulate these sums. So we get sum 0 plus sum 1. That is actually equal to A1 plus A0 plus A2, plus A3. And our goal is to be able to get summation of all of them from I equals 0 through 19, right? So now what's going to happen is in the next stage, we have our delay element, right? So sum 0 is going to be here. And what I'm describing is this cycle, cycle 5, right? So we've got our second sum, so this is sum 1, that's A1, I mean, sorry, that's A2 plus A3. We have A5 plus A4 here, and then we have A7 plus A6, and then we have A9 
plus A8. So then we have it in a delay element. So now we get some zero here in the next cycle, cycle six. And what we're going to be doing is we're now going to be putting in one number and that previous sum and then looping through. So the way it's going to work is in, in cycle six, we're going to get sum zero here. So instead of putting A11 and A10, we're going to put in A10 and that previous sum into the first stage. And then we're here. So that's this guy. And then A9 and A8, you see how they've all kind of moved over? Like so. Common, commonly on exam, students will write the first one. Instead of writing A1 and A0 again, they'll just go like this. And then sum, right? So you see how that can save you a lot of time doing it that way. And plus, you by doing that, you're actually demonstrating you understand how it goes through the pipe. So that would save you time and demonstrates understanding. So then the next stage, so then what's going to happen is we're going to keep going here up until, we're, so we're going to get these sums up until the point where we hit A19, right? So here's, the, here's how I do, you can do the math here. Once you start getting to cy, uh, cycle six, I've added more than you would need to demonstrate on an exam in order to get full credit, just to show the pattern. You see how it works? Sum zero plus A10. Some one plus A11, some two, some three, some four. So what you would want to do is you would want to figure out how many cycles you need to get to in order to get to that last one. So we know it's uh, 20, right? So we know we start at sum zero and A10, and we started at A0, so we need to get to A19. So we're going to be at six. And we're going to eventually get to, well, we're going to add 9 here, so it's going to be A19 plus sum of 9, right? Because we're adding 9 to sum of 0. And so then that becomes sum of 8 plus A18, sum of 7 plus 17, sum of 6 plus 16, sum of 5 plus 15. So if you're able to do this math here, what you can then do once you get to the cycle six, you can actually probably just get rid of all this here and just say this will continue until the next input. So, so sum x equals sum of x plus 5 plus, plus a plus 5, right? Or you can sum, say sum of a of 9. Like, so this is an equation I came up with. The whole idea is sum of 19 is going to equal sum of 9, I'm sorry, sum 10, sorry, is going to equal sum of 9 plus A19, right? So this is, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to go over this one more time because this, this can be a part where people get hung up on. The whole idea is you figure out how many times it takes before you start, re, you know, looping back in sums, right? So, What's going to happen is you get sum zero, and it comes back. And these x's can be multiplexers. It can either choose the next value to pipe in, or it can choose the previous sum. We want to choose the previous sum because that's how we can get this accumulation of the sum accumulation, which is why we're doing this whole linear pipeline adder in the first place. So it's four stages, and it has 20 integers. So let me let's change the problem. Let's say I wanted to change this to 10 integers, right? And we get rid of all of this. Delete cells, right? Uh, let me change, I'm sorry, let me change it to eight, 10 integers isn't quite right. Um, let's change it to 15, that's better. So you get rid of all of this, right? So that's sufficient to, to demonstrate understanding. And this will continue. So here we want to get up to A of 14, right? So then we can go sum of 14 until A14. And then we would just, since we're adding 4 here, we just add 4 here. So sum of 
zero becomes sum of four. And what's going to happen is this just becomes that number plus one. So that would be five. So you saw in the previous one it was 20. It was sum of nine and this became sum of 10. So if it was 15, it becomes sum of four plus sum of five just because of the difference in numbers. And the reason why it's a difference in 10 is because we got the A of 10 first before we started adding in uh, the feedback because of that delay. So this one, instead of cycle 15, we would add 4, so this becomes cycle 11. So instead of having to write out cycle 8, cycle 9, cycle 10, you can just write cycle 11. So if I did this as a 30 sum of uh, 30 sums, right? This would be the same thing. If I did this 30, it would actually go like this up until A of 10. So I'm adding 20. So this becomes 30. So sum of 0 plus 20 is sum of 20. And that would become sum 21. And then we add 7. So that becomes 7. This would be 27. So if you understand this part, I could throw 100 at you, and doing this wouldn't be terribly complicated. So now what's going to happen is once we get to this stage, so if we, if we leave us at 27, let me uh, go back to the original problem. Okay, so we're at 15. So here's the thing. We are now at the stage where we have a sum here. We've put in sum of 9 plus uh, a19, right? And then we have a sum here, sum of 8 in the delay, right? So we have this sum in the delay. Now here's the problem. We don't have any more numbers to feed back to the front, right? So I get here, I put a number here, and I don't have a number yet, a second number. So what, what do I need to do? No. Insert a stall. You all see the word stall down there. Why do I need to insert a stall? You need to wait until we get the second number, right? Stall, and then you get a second one. So here's how that pattern works. And I'll let me move this so that way I know what time it is, so that way I don't keep you guys past 10.45. So we get down here, and we insert a stall. And what's going to happen is sum 11 is going to be coming around. And then we'll get sum of 10 and 11. There's a stall. Sum of 9, A19. Sum of 13. Sum of 12. Right? And then you're going to keep going like this. And then here's what's going to happen. Once you're done with A of all these ones where you have a sum plus the original one, eventually you're going to get to this point right here. We have sum of 13 plus sum of 12, sum of 11 plus sum of 10. And then we have to wait for sum of 15 to come through. So we have to insert a second stall. So you have sum of 15 plus sum of 14. And that goes all the way through. That becomes sum of 17. Then sum of 17 plus 16 becomes sum of 18, right? And the reason why it's sum of 18 is we have 20 numbers, right? So if you're adding, if you're, if you're using your two-bit adder to do this, I mean, so your, your, your two-input adder, you would have a sum, a plus one, right? And it comes through, and then you have a result. If you took that and added it one here, you would do that. So the whole goal is you have to add that number, you have 18 num add additions to make. I'm sorry, 19 additions to make because it's some zero through some 18. Because if you have, if it's, if you're adding four numbers, you make one addition here, two, and three additions. So it's going to be the number you put in minus one. And it will always end like this in a four-stage data path because you've got to once you've got all the numbers in, because you only have a number of a certain number of additions to be able to put in to, to get these solved. So it'll always be this many, it'll take 14. The reason why I can prove that 
the reason I can say that with proof is because I have this, uh, this many elements left, right? So I have one, two, three, four, five, right? So I need to be able to do an addition sum, one, two, three, and four. So sum of 12 comes back. We had sum of 11 here, sum of 11, sum 13 and 12 here. So then 14 has to be solved twice. So we got 14 and 15. And so basically, if you do it this way, if we had that 100 problem, instead of going, oh my god, he wants us to do 100, you just go like this and you say, okay, well, 100 comes like here. So it would be... Right? So we're getting from some, we're getting from A11 to A of 99. So that you realize that's 89, right? So we got to add 89 to here. So right, and so that then you add 89 again. So it's 87. 7 plus 89 is 93, right? And then you just go 94, 95, 96, 97, 98. So just plus 14 is 107. And having given that problem before, 107 is the right answer. So if you understand the pipeline aspects and you're able to put it in that manner, it can be 100, 200, 30, 20. It, the problem is the same difficulty. So does anybody have... I want to uh, take a couple of minutes to have a quick discussion, but does anybody have any questions about this? All right, so I'll post the video and and, uh, and then I'll uh, post the homework as well. So I have a quick question. I want your guys' uh, feedback. So the reason I have been doing the quizzes as pop in the past is because I used to have a problem when I was teaching USF with students just turning into TGO and then just leaving. And um, what I want you guys, to, but you, that hasn't been a problem much at, at Ole Miss. Um, you guys come in and you stay, which is good. Um, so I'm considering uh, having, changing it, like there's going to be one more quiz this semester to actually announcing the date of the quiz. But my question to you would be, what would motivate you to come to class? Because ultimately, I want to reward effort and the people who are here between 9.30 and 10.45 and actually doing the work, you know what I'm saying? So if I take away that, I want to be able to have another way of rewarding the people who are doing their work. So I wanted any feedback you guys had or give you the opportunity to kind of ruminate on it. Uh, that's, that's the way I can improve the course for future students and for the rest of the semester as well. So any, any ideas? Food? Food? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're a bunch of Chick-fil-A biscuits. Yeah. Oh, man. If I, if I had Chick-fil-A biscuits, I'd be eating them in front of you during the quiz. <laughs> Should have studied. Could have joined with me. <laughs> but you forgot that truth table process. <laughs> any, any other ideas? Like, what would, what's something that would actually get, like, if you're from the student's perspective, like, what would actually get you to go, like, man, that's something I would, like, put in that extra effort. So I don't want to just make you feel compelled, I want to motivate as well. If I do bad on a test, I like to get worth my way to get some of that point back. Okay, well that's but that relates to but I'm gonna talk about relating to attendance. A bunch of go like that. It's like you if you miss one in six, you don't get to drop three quizzes or something like that. Okay. So uh, you do an option like that, drop a grade. So uh, so I could do something so I could do something where I have like a brief problem at the beginning of a class, like to give you guys a review and if if you if you do a certain number of them, you could actually turn in a previous exam to earn some of the credit back. Is that what you're saying? Okay, so I could give like a, a brief five minute problem, it would take five minutes at the end of class and you turn that in, and I keep record of that, and then I go, okay, you got above a, 
you get above that 85 or 90 percent on it, then you can go back to your second exam if you bombed it pretty poorly. Okay, so here's a deal I'll make with you. Do you all still have your exam one and exam two? Yeah. Okay, so here's the deal. I'll come up with a small problem at the end of every lecture. And if you turn them all in, because we, I mean, I, I should make it all because there's only a few more lectures left. Then what you can do, uh, after you get done with your finals, there's a, there's a certain amount of time between when I have to submit final grades and your final exams. So I don't want you doing this during your finals. I want you focusing on your, your tests. But um, if, you get, if you turn them all in, you can pick one of your exams, and I'll let you redo it. And I'll try to give you some points back and possibly bring the grade up. If you now some of you may be happy with the grade you got, and you're like, you know what? I'm done. But for those of you who are B C borderline or C D borderlines or A B borderlines, you might really want that opportunity. Okay, that's what I'll do. So um, the I will give the the fourth quiz will be the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. It will be related to pipelining. Uh, so I'll give a uh, problem related to, you know, the, the four problems you have to figure out the, yeah. Did you say Tuesday? Uh, with this, this Tuesday, no, no, I'm talking about the, there's a, uh, isn't there a whole week? There's next week. Yeah, we have next week. There's a, no, I'm talking about the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Yeah, so you have week. week, and then, so next week, and then there's the week after that, that Tuesday. No, next week. Yeah, next week. Next week. Next week. Next week. Last day of the break. Yeah. Oh, next okay. Week. The last week. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we have another week between then and, and two months. Well, nice. yeah. hmm. That time's flying. I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll send out a note to the 1045, and I know a couple of you got a physics exam. You really have to uh, All right, thanks for the feedback, and I'll get to work on that. Thank you.